Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. The storm that affected the Calgary area was tragic. We have all seen the awful pictures of the damage that was done by hell and flooding, and our sympathies go out to all those who were affected. My colleagues from Calgary haven't taken a day off since this disaster occurred, nor have the good people at the Alberta Emergency Management Agency. Notably, Minister Sonny and our other MLA colleagues here today have been doing commendable work on the ground, helping to connect people with the insurance companies and coverage. Today, we will be providing an update on how our government is going to help cargo recover from this disaster. I am joined by Premier Justin Kenney, Community and Social Services Minister Rajan Sonny, MLA for Calgary Northeast, Mickey Emery, MLA for Calgary Cross, Devin Dottor, MLA for Calgary Falcon Ridge, Parliamentary Secretary Mohamed Yassin, MLA for Calgary North, and Shane Scriber, the Managing Director of Alberta Emergency Management Agency. To provide more details on how our government will be helping Calgary recover and rebuild, I will now turn the microphone over to Premier Justin Kenney. Premier. Thanks very much, Casey, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, as well, Ministers uh, Sani uh, uh, for being here, as well as MLAs Mickey Amory, Devinder Tour, and Mohamed Yassin for an important announcement about disaster relief for southern Alberta communities affected by the extreme rain and hailstorms that happened uh, in the region on uh, the 13th of June, uh, Saturday. People who live in the view of the Rocky Mountains in southern Alberta count themselves blessed to do so most of the time. But the beauty and grandeur of the mountains and the year-round recreational opportunities that they offer do come at a price. When clouds heavily laden with Pacific moisture pass over the mountains and drop down into the foot foothills, it routinely generates uh, high winds and all kinds of turbulent local weather, as Calgarians know very well. Most of the, that weather is benign, Chinooks in winter and thunder showers in spring and summer, but sometimes violent storm cells develop that can produce not only gale force winds and lightning, uh, but severe hail and even tornadoes. That's what happened on June 13. Environment Canada issued a severe thunderstorm watch just before noon on that day and then upgraded it to a warning at 6.37 p.m. after spotting a huge angry storm south of Alberta, uh, uh, south of High River, excuse me, barreling north at 60 kilometers an hour. It struck Calgary just after 7 p.m., pulverizing especially the northeast quadrant of the city and parts of Airdrie and Rocky View County as well, with tennis, tennis ball-sized hail, torrential winds, and sheets of rain. The hail shredded siding on homes and businesses and shattered windows and windshields and pounded deep dents in cars and trucks. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but the hail and flood damage was massive. Well, when I say no one was hurt, I do have friends, actually, who were outside and they got pelted pretty bad, but thankfully, nobody was seriously hurt or hospitalized. Storm, storm sewers were overwhelmed, uh, 250 pound manhole covers blew off like bottle caps. Several roadways and tunnels around the airport were underwater, uh, stranding some drivers and even inundating the Calgary Police Service West Winds campus. And I know that the WestJet campus on the airport as well was affected. In places, uh, the hail piled up so high that it looked like a winter snowstorm. Nearly 400 homes and small businesses suffered some over the surface flood damage. At least 20 were filled to the main floor with water and 15,000 homes were without power for a period. Following a uh, detailed hydrological analysis, the Alberta Emergency Management Agency has classified this as an extraordinary event, meaning that it is a, has met the one in 25 year threshold. That means that the storm in Calgary, Airdrie, and surrounding areas qualifies for funding under the Government of Alberta's Disaster Relief Program. Uh, we uh, will uh, expedite a package to help cover uninsurable loss and damages uh, and costs incurred by the cities of Calgary, Airdrie, and Rocky View County. Most of the damage to homes and businesses, as well as vehicles, will of course be covered by private insurance. The Insurance Bureau of Canada's initial estimate 
of insured damage uh, claims is between 250 and 500 million dollars. I understand that the uh, through the IBC that insurance companies have received more than 35,000 uh, claims for damages, uh, and 99% of those uh, that have been submitted have been assessed uh, to have coverage. Fewer than 1% have been uh, assessed as not having coverage. But recognizing that some damages are uninsured, we'll continue working with the Mayor and Council on community needs. And I just spoke to Mayor Nenshi uh, again about this matter in the past uh, hour, and we appreciate uh, the uh, good work of the City of Calgary in, in helping Calgarians get through this. Natural disasters are a fact of life here in Alberta and around the world. Many places endure far worse events than we do, including hurricanes and typhoons, but between fires and floods, we're cer certainly are getting our share of nature's wrath this year and in recent years. But every time this happens, Albertans are there for each other. That's what I was so touched to see in uh, visiting families with Minister Sani uh, in Northeast Calgary last weekend to see how the community came together immediately. Neighbours helping neighbours, charities and faith organizations, organizations reaching out to those severely affected uh, and that is exactly the Alberta spirit that will get us through this. Uh, it, this was the spirit as I say of uh, last year's epic fire season and again uh, this, in this spring's northern ice jams and floods. I want to say a special thank you to the first responders in the uh, city of Calgary uh, for having been on the scene uh, helping residents uh, so immediately following the hailstorm uh, to EMS, fire police, uh, utility workers and others who restored service, uh, cleared, uh, drained uh, waterways and, and opened up uh, the northeast quadrant of the city as quickly as possible following the storm. Uh, and so uh, I once again want to say that uh, we will be working with the City of Calgary on the details of the disaster relief uh, program response and funding we await uh, their initial application. Typically the way this works is that the affected municipalities uh, will submit a uh, application under the DRP um, that delineates their estimates of um, the need to repair or replace affected uh, municipal infrastructure in addition to uh, the cost of emergency response and in addition uh, the uh, potential uh, payments to support uninsurable uh, uh, damage, I should say, to uninsurable private property. So as uh, is normally the case with the DRP, we will work very closely with the municipality on this, and I look forward uh, to hearing now from Minister Sani. Well, I guess I go this way. Yes. Thank you, Premier and Minister Madhu, and good afternoon, everyone. As MLA for Calgary Northeast, along with my colleagues, MLAs Amory, Tour, and Yassine, I know that this is welcome news for our constituents. I know that a disaster recovery program will assist the city and area residents to respond to this devastating event. We have heard you, and I know that Premier witnessed the impacts firsthand when we inspected the storm area last weekend and we met with many families who were impacted. Recovery will not happen overnight. I know that many of the people listening may still be trying to access repairs and supports. I want you to know that your government is here. We are listening and we are responding. Our government will be with you as you rebuild and respond to the impacts of this extreme weather incident. If you have unresolved concerns, please know that we are available to help you navigate through the supports. Please do reach out to our constituency offices. Thank you and thank you so much for your patience. Okay, we'll begin the Q&A. Reminder to everyone on the phone that Shane Schreiber, Managing Director of the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, is also here to answer questions. Operator, can you put through the first caller, please? First is Rick Bell with the Calgary Sun. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, good afternoon, Premier. I actually have a question on another topic. My apologies. Um, how, how do you respond to the growing number of stories in the last week following the Fair Deal panel? There's been a growing number of stories increasing coverage on either A, separatism, B, separatism as a threat, C, a more aggressive stance towards Ottawa and toward the Trudeau government. Uh, how do you respond to that? And 
Will you concede that the announcement that Jay Hill is now involved with the separatist movement, Mr. Hill being a former colleague of yours, uh, does give a boost or somewhat higher profile to that cause? So those are my two questions. All right, Rick. Well, as I've said for the last couple of years, the fact that many Albertans are talking about separation underscores the profound frustration in this province about our place uh, in Canada, the profound frustration with governments, both federal and provincial, that have blocked our resources, pinned us in, and uh, and made us uh, feel like we can't actually develop the resources that pay the bills in the Canadian Federation. That is, uh, it is exactly because of that frustration that we laid out uh, a strategy to get a fair deal in our election platform that was endorsed by 56% uh, of voters last spring. Uh, it's also why last November I appointed the Fair Deal Panel uh, to uh, consult broadly with Albertans on, a speci on specific ideas uh, to get a fair deal. And uh, I want to thank once again the panelists for their report. Uh, these were bold ideas. Um, and we are acting. We are acting more assertively than I believe any government in the history of Alberta. Uh, for uh, a greater powers of autonomy of this province uh, within the United Canada uh, and for the, the right to develop our economy, uh, return to prosperity, uh, and to address many of the structural uh, issues in the Federation that has held Alberta back. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, to give you a point of comparison, Rick, back in um, about 15 years ago, Premier Klein appointed a similar panel made up of uh, uh, then PC caucus members uh, to consult on ideas that had emanated from the so-called firewall letter and they came back and recommended against pretty much every one of those ideas none of them were embraced or pursued by the then Alberta government and that includes the things that we are now doing that that we have endorsed that were recommended by the fair deal panel this government uh, committed to fight first of all to repeal the carbon tax we did it as bill one uh, we committed to then fight the Trudeau carbon tax, and we did, winning on a vote of four to one in the Alberta Appeal Court. We know that's going to the Supreme Court, and our strategy of getting allies across the country is working. We even have Quebec joining an alliance of six provinces against the federal carbon tax at the Supreme Court. We are challenging the constitutionality of Bill C-69, the No More Pipelines Law. We are challenging the tanker ban, Bill C-48, uh, by supporting a First Nation uh, through the Indigenous uh, Defense Fund, a First Nation whose economic uh, rights are being impaired by that federal liberal policy. We have created, we, are, we have legislation before the ledge right now to create the Alberta Parole Board, part of a platform commitment. We have uh, confirmed we're going to create our own Alberta Chief Firearms Officer, something that Premier Klein, Premier Klein's government refused to do. Uh, they were went with the federal chief firearms officer. Uh, we have been obviously uh, demanding fundamental changes to equalization, something that previous Alberta governments did not do. Uh, we uh, have managed to get all 13 provinces and territories on side to uh, lift the unfair cap on the fiscal stabilization program, uh, which should be like an equalization rebate for Alberta, which would be worth billions of dollars for this province. We have renewed the Senate Election Act that was lapsed under the NDP. And we'll be holding an election for our senators, uh, senators uh, next fall. We have committed to a referendum on equalization. Uh, and we are going to do the deep policy work necessary to inform a decision by Albertans about potentially reestablishing an Alberta Provincial Police Service and establishing an Alberta pension plan like Quebec has. Uh, I could go on. The point is uh, that talk is cheap. Action is what matters. And this government is acting, acting to create alliances across the country so that we don't go to Ottawa isolated, acting to maximize our leverage, um, acting to fight federal policies that hurt this province, uh, but also acting with, I hope, whiz strategic wisdom. Because I know so many Albertans are rightfully ticked off with the way that they've been treated in recent years, and many want just to see that 
um, emotional response. Well, we are passionate about this, but we have to uh, remember that this is uh, a, a long-term fight to get fundamental reforms, to get a fair deal, and that means it's about str st uh, the strategy and not just a bunch of short-term tactics. The, in other words, uh, in addressing these issues, we uh, are playing uh, chess and not checkers. We should not and will not blow all of our ammunition um, in, in this fight for fairness for Alberta. We need to sequence these things, maximize our leverage, create alliances, and ultimately get results. And we are getting some results. The billion dollars uh, that are now creating uh, over 5,000 jobs in Alberta through the accelerated well reclamation, uh, something we've been pounding the table demanding. The um, uh, equivalency agreement on methane regulations that is going to save Alberta energy producers hundreds of millions of dollars and save jobs. Um, the equivalency agreement on the tier program, if, if the feds had imposed that on industry, it would have cost us billions of dollars. So there's a whole lot more to do on that, I agree, uh, but uh, we're going to pr pr proceed more assertively than I believe any Alberta government in history, but we're going to do it wisely to get the results. And uh, in terms of Mr. Hill, I spoke to that uh, yesterday. Um, I don't think that that fundamentally changes things. Rick, uh, there have been, look, I do not dismiss the anger and frustration that lies behind separatist sentiment. It is real and it must be dealt with seriously and respectfully. The NDP's approach is just to insult and, and, and marginalize Albertans who feel that way. I think that's just counterproductive. Uh, and so while I acknowledge the, le, the true heartfelt passion of those folks, I've laid out before why I think talking, to, you know, pursuing separation would be massively counterproductive. This coming week, we will celebrate Canada, Canada Day. And I think the, I know, I know that the overwhelming majority of Albertans on Canada Day will say, there are problems in this country, problems we got to fix, but we're proud to belong to this country. We're proud of the sacrifices of those who built it. And we are not going to let one particular uh, federal government or one bad set of policies make us feel unwelcome in our country that we have done, we have sacrificed so much to help build. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Terry Reith with CBC. Go ahead, Terry. Yes, hi, and thank you for taking the call. Uh, Mr. Kenny, the NDP has called on you to fire your speechwriter, Paul Bunner. Will you, and what are your thoughts on this controversy? Well, first of all, I think this is about uh, an article he wrote as a journalist uh, many years ago. Uh, about uh, the legacy of Indian residential schools. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the article. I've seen excerpts, and I fundamentally disagree with those statements. Let me quote for you what I said uh, in the legislature last week in a, a debate on Motion 24 that I put before the Assembly to condemn uh, racism, and particularly uh, the pernicious and durable form of, of racism, of anti-black racism, and of the long and sad history of anti-Indigenous institutional racism in Canada. I said this, quotes, We as Canadians are still coming to terms with the terrible devastation of our Indigenous communities through the regime of Indian residential schools and where, where children were torn away from their parents, where families were destroyed by the abusive power of the state in an effort to completely deracinate Indigenous children from their families, their languages and their cultures. We must acknowledge that the system was fundamentally flawed, the system was fundamentally racist in its nature, and was an official policy of the Government of Canada, supported as well by the Government of Alberta, other provincial governments, and institutions of civil society. We must acknowledge that just as the vestiges of slavery in the United States continue to reverberate down to this day, so too does the racism that lies at the heart of the residential schools continue to reverberate through Indigenous communities to our own time." Unquote. That is my view. That is the position of the government of Alberta. I, I uh, imagine that somebody who was a journalist for 40 years will have written uh, things that uh, 
are uh, that, that I disagree with, that I and others may find offensive. Um, I want to uh, say that uh, I just see a comment here from Chief Willie Littlechild about this matter, which I think is, is insightful, where he sa essentially says that we all have a journey to walk through on this issue. And I, I think we're all learning about, for example, the, the reality and legacy of uh, the Aboriginal residential schools. Uh, and uh, former Grand Chief Littlechild says that he wants to work shoulder to shoulder with people like Paul when we have challenges like this, let's talk about it and see how we can find a solution. Uh, it would serve us much greater if we walked that path together. I think that's important for all of us to learn and to listen in humility. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Kelly Kreiderman with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, Kelly. Hi there, Premier. I'm wondering, given um, you know the neighborhoods hit by this hailstorm on June 13th are working class neighborhoods that aren't working right now because of the pandemic. Whether you would consider any further form of aid for people who ha who might have a lot of difficulty right now paying deductibles if they're living on CERB right now. My second question is whether you can tell us any of the broad strokes of the economic recovery plan that you're going to roll out on Monday and Tuesday or Tuesday. Sure. First, on the first question, we acknowledge that so many of the folks uh, who were hit by the hailstorm were already going through a period of, of adversity, which is true of people right across this province. Uh, five years of economic stagnation, the coronavirus recession, the collapse of energy prices. And so this could not have come at a worse time. And we know this is going to be a, a real challenge. At the same time, I, I don't believe it would be responsible uh, for us to have taxpayers bail out the big insurance companies. Uh, the, the damage, uh, first of all, we, the government through the disaster recovery program will be providing support uh, for damage to uh, uninsurable private property, as we've done in the past, uh, as we will in the future. That support will be there, in addition to uh, support for the city's uh, emergency response. Um, with respect to insurable private property, uh, if the government steps in, and starts making uh, payments for insurable private property, that would create a very serious moral hazard where people would, in the future, say they have no need to, to insure their property, uh, and it effectively would bail out the insurance companies. Why would they make good on their policy obligations if the government is stepping in to do so instead? And I don't want to let the insurance companies off the hook. We are going to work with the affected residents and the city uh, to ensure that the insurance companies honor those policies and do so generously, erring on the side of the claimants. So far, the Insurance Bureau of Canada has indicated that they have uh, approved, I guess their company members have approved 99% of the applications as qualifying uh, for uh, insurance following the event. Um, if, again, if, if the government were to step in and act as a huge insurance company, then effectively we would have a, I believe, an obligation to do that forever into the future. And there would also be a lack of equity for people who uh, are in, have been in similar circumstances in the past. We had a huge uh, hailstorm with uh, apparently hundreds of millions of dollars of damage, more in Airdrie a few years back. Um, and the government of Alberta responded with the same uh, program, the disaster recovery program, under the same parameters, uh, assisting people with repairing uh, uninsurable private property. So um, that has been the uh, approach of, of, of every Alberta government for obvious reasons. Uh, I've spoken to uh, Mayor Nenshi about the issue you raise about folks who, who are facing uh, real financial distress. Uh, there are a suite of programs that the Alberta government already has available, income support and various other kinds of programs. Um, we will continue to work with the mayor and the city uh, uh, to respond uh, uh, to the needs uh, of, of folks affected in Northeast Calgary, uh, but we are not going to bail out the insurance companies. Oh, on, a, on the second question, um, the yes, we will be uh, 
unveiling the economic recovery strategy of Alberta early next week. It will be a bold and ambitious plan uh, to get through this crisis and to emerge stronger with uh, record levels of job creating investments in capital and infrastructure. It will be a, uh, you'll see a very significant increase to the highest level in Alberta history in terms of an annual uh, capital expenditure to create jobs on projects that will improve the productivity of Al Alberta's economy in the long term. We will also be taking further action on the tax front to clearly establish Alberta as the best place in Canada in which to invest. Uh, we will be announcing the outlines of an exciting new program to incentivize job creating investment in the uh, information technology, uh, digital and innovation sector. We will be outlining a number of uh, sectoral strategies in areas of our economy that we need to grow in order to diversify while also articulating policies that ensure a strong future for the oil and gas sector. So this is not all of the details uh, will be included in next week's announcement. There will be a, a lot of content there, but um, there will be more to follow in the weeks and months to come as we provide details for each of the sectoral strategies. But this is going to be a very big and bold plan. It will be, I think, by an order of magnitude, the most ambitious economic recovery plan offered by any Canadian province, at least to date. Okay, we have time for one more. Operator, can you please put through the last caller? All right, it's uh, Dean Bennett with the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Dean. Oh, good morning, Premier. I just want to follow up uh, on Terry Reef's question. Three points, uh, if I may. Uh, point one, were you aware of uh, Paul Buhner's views on Indigenous or on, on the residential schools when you hired him as your speechwriter? I take from your points that will there be any change to his status as your speechwriter as a result of this? And if not, uh, how do you square that with the comments that you've made earlier in the sense that you've stressed that while he has nothing to do with policy, you know, in, in Premier Kenny's circle, personnel is policy. Well, I would say on the first question, no, I was not aware, but I, I've been told that this was actually a news story uh, several years ago, uh, five years ago or so. Uh, and uh, secondly, um, I speak for the government of Alberta. Uh, as I did in my remarks about Indian residential schools in the assembly a week ago today, very clearly. Um, and as I've done consistently in our government's uh, approach to uh, reconciliation, more than that, reconciliation, the, through the cre creation of the Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, our uh, Crown Indigenous Summits, our uh, Alberta First Nations Protocols, um, Next, we just announced the uh, uh, in new investments in connecting First Nations to municipal water infrastructure last week to uh, provide uh, clean drinking water in Alberta First Nations, and so much more that has been done. And I'm uh, gratified with the progress that, that we've been making. Uh, just yesterday, I met for two hours with the Board of the Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. They have some very exciting things to announce. So those are the initiatives of the government. As I said, uh, somebody who was a journalist for 40 years undoubtedly uh, wrote things with which I disagree. Uh, that does not uh, reflect or change the policy of the government of Alberta. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.